A champion is bred from hard times, scarred mind standing on the ledge. The squad grind all time, victory in spite of opposition. Welcome to competition. You pick a side, I pick a side, they pick a side. Take a knee against abuse, they rather you die. Pushing through dark tunnels, trying to shed light. The fight is on the moment we enter the game of life. Get it right for the whole thing, gone dead. Let's go ahead and take it there. Meet me on the edge. Welcome to Edge of Sports, the TV show only on the Real News Network. I'm Dave Zirin, and this week we are talking to a legend, 1968 Olympic medalist, one of the two men who raised their black glove fists on the medal stand in Mexico City in a moment for the ages, the fastest humanitarian alive, Dr. John Carlos. Also, I've got some choice words about the Professional Golfers Association Tour joyously selling out to its Saudi Arabia-run competitor, the Live Tour. And in our Ask a Sports Scholar segment, we talked to Dr. Maria Verai about a book she co-wrote with Rita Liberti called Gridiron Gourmet, Gender and Food at the Football Tailgate. But first, a word of caution, if you will. With Dr. John Carlos, we are going to be discussing loss. You see, Dr. Carlos was part of a generation that self-identified as being part of a black athlete's revolt. And in just the last several months, a heartbreaking number of the people who made up this revolt, people who were either athletes or artists that contributed to the struggle, have left us. Maybe you've heard of all the people we're going to discuss, or maybe you haven't but they all meant something to Dr. John Carlos and they all meant something to the history of sports. And we're going to speak to him about all of these folks by phone right now. Dr. Carlos, how are you? Real fine, Dave. It's an honor and a pleasure to be talking to you today. Yeah, this is a special show because we're about to pay tribute to some folks who've passed away. But first and foremost, how are you in this trying time? Well, man, you know, it's, it's a sad situation for me because so many of my, my friends uh, in, in the work that I do in my social life and my sports life have uh, moved on. Yeah. So it's, it's a trying time for me right now. Well, let's talk about some of the people who've passed. I just want to get your your thoughts, uh, maybe something about them that maybe we don't know, and maybe raise up their names uh, as they transition. Uh, let's start with your fellow 1968 Olympian, the first person to run the 100 meters in under 10 seconds, the great Jimmy Hines. What can you tell us about Jimmy Hines? Well, I, I met Jimmy Hines. I was a young, 21-year-old. Jimmy was a young, 20 20- you know, individual, we went to school in Texas. He went to East, uh, I went to East Texas State. He went to the Texas Southern. Jimmy was a very formidable young athlete. He uh, it was, had a tremendous amount of confidence in his ability. I, I didn't know of Jimmy's record back in high school. I found out later that he was undefeated all through his high school years. Mm. It just added on to his determination to be a winner. Uh, aside from that, he was always a nice guy. Uh, methodical about his competition, uh, aggressive, I might say, you know, always wanted to be the head of the pack, so to speak. Uh, I enjoyed being with Jimmy. I enjoyed traveling with him. I enjoyed his competition. And uh, most of all, man, I enjoyed the fact that we were in the greatest Olympics of all time together. No doubt. No doubt. You know, we also lost the oldest living U.S. Olympic medalist, a man who medaled at the 1948 Olympics. He just passed at the age of 101. What can you tell us about Mr. Herbert Douglas? Well, the great, the great Herb Douglas. Well, Mr. Douglas was a formidable young man, I might say, in, in his demise. Uh, Mr. Douglas was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, his father was a blind individual. I think his father was the first one to have the, the guide dog. Mm. So Herb came up with the tutelage of an individual that couldn't see him, but taught him so much. It taught him about character, taught him about responsibility, taught him about being aggressive towards uh, learning as much as you can and solving the issues of society. Uh, when I met Herb, 
Herb thought I was just a young, loudmouth individual <laughs> kid. And and one day he had an opportunity to observe my my loudness. Uh, and I was stepping up for those individuals at the Olympic trials uh, that were senior citizens, such as Herb and hmm. uh, Stan Wright and all the seniors that was involved in track and field, Dr. Uh, Leroy Walker. Uh, they were all, and they were being disrespected, and I wouldn't allow that to happen. So I turned the volume to make sure that they showed and gave respect to those individuals. And Mr. Douglas took a note of that. Hmm. And he got in touch with some people and said, you know, I've been looking – all through the bushes for the diamond in the rough or uh, uh, the needle in the haystack. And here he's been before me all this time in the eyes of John Carlos. And from that point on, when we got together, uh, we were good buddies, uh, but even more, he was like a father figure and a mentor to me. I had a lot of time to sit back and observe her and get the knowledge from her. And at the same time, have an opportunity to see a man of his age and his stature to have such a physical element about them. I remember one time Herb hit me in my gut and at that time he must have been about 95 years old. And a man that hit you that hard with that hmm. much bigger at that age, you knew he was a special individual. Wow. Well, you and I are going to toast Herb when you hit your 101. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that, that moment where we're going to pay some special tribute to Herb. You know, also someone who passed away was someone who was a legend at three separate Olympics, 1960, 1964, and of course the greatest Olympics of all time, 1968 in Mexico City. And I'm talking about Ralph Boston. What can you tell us about the late Ralph Boston? Well, before I get into Mr. Boston, you, you hit the word legend. And I want you to know, and everyone out there is listening, that each individual that we mentioned today is a living legend. And in my 78 years, I don't recall any time we had a cluster of legends to die in such a short span of time. Never. So whoever the kid is, he must have a master plan to put all of them on the bus to come to him at this particular time. Ralph Boston. I met Ralph when I was a young kid in high school. Uh, I was working for the Puma Shoe Company. Ralph was up at Fordham University getting ready to go to the Olympic trials over at Randall's Island in New York. I didn't know who he was, but I observed him, and he was looking in his bag for something. And I saw that disgust on his face because whatever he was looking for wasn't there. So I took the initiative to approach him and ask him, say, man, did you lose something? Uh, you need something? He said to me, he said, man, I need a tape. I left my measuring tape. And I said to him, I said, what, what do you need? He said, well, I need a 100-foot tape. So we had like a, a steel 100-foot tape with the Puma Company. And I went to the Puma people and told them, say, I need a 100-foot tape. They say, for who? I say, for that guy over there. Oh, we can't give him a tape, man. He's Adidas. And I had to make them understand at my young age that it doesn't matter the fact that he's Adidas. It doesn't matter the fact that he's a Puma. It, what matters is that he's one of the greatest athletes in our era. And if we can do anything to help him today in the long run, regardless of which shoe it is, Puma, Adidas, whatever, He's going to be in our corner to support us as we support him now. And that's how Ralph and I became very good friends. From that point on, it just grew, grew, and grew. When Ralph went down to the University of Tennessee and became the dean down there, he brought me and others down there to speak to the students down there to try and give them some insight as to what was going on in social life, what was going on in the athletic world. Mm -hmm. Ralph was just a, a wide open guy to try and help society in any way he felt that he could. Mm. You know, the next person is somebody who could have been a decathlete at the 1956 Olympics if he'd made that choice, but he chose otherwise. I'm, of course, talking about uh, Jim Brown, someone we've spoken about on this show. Now, before, before I ask you some of your reflections about Jim Brown, when I think of you and Jim Brown, I think of two people who really don't like taking shit from other people. <laughs> Um, did you and Jim, uh, how was your relationship? Uh, did you guys clash? Did you guys get along? What was it like with you and Jim Brown? No, we, we gelled. I understood Jim Brown. Uh, you know, like a guy wrote me one time when I told him about I love Jim Brown on the internet, and he brought up Jim Brown's negative part of his, his life, you know, with this woman where he throwed this woman off the balcony, this, that, and the other. And I had to explain to an individual that Jim Brown is not – a long grain of sand. And in the sport in which he participated in 
banging your head, someone banging your head, you banging your head, constantly, it, you become a very aggressive person. And when you apply that aggressiveness, it doesn't channel into saying, well, I can be aggressive because this is a man, or I can be aggressive because this is a child. You're just aggressive. And until you can learn to make that adjustment and hold back, you have to understand that these individuals are in a psych psychological uh, realm. And at that particular time, people didn't understand understand about the mental trauma or the head trauma that these individuals in that sport has taken. So I told the guy, don't ridicule Mr. Brown because he's done far better things than he's did for this negative instance that you're trying to put out today. Uh, Jim was always uh, straightforward. Uh, he had his own mindset. Once he had his mind made, no one was going to change his mind because he felt that he was right. And I find that Jim had always had a tendency to evaluate things that he did before he did it. Mm. I have respect for Jim uh, of the utmost mm. because uh, he never backed down from who he was. He never backed down in terms of speaking on the issues when it was necessary to speak. When most individuals talked about gangs in terms of gang activity, Jim was one of those individuals that rolled up his sleeves and went into the hood, went into the neighborhood to try and reach these young kids to, to make them see a better day. I always have respect for that because many individuals sat back and talk the game, but never played the game. Wow, exactly. And and we spoke about Jim Brown, all facets and dimensions of his life uh, on a previous episode here at Edge of Sports. But, you know, your words really do round it out for us. Just a couple more names for you. And it re really is staggering the amount of talent, cultural talent we've lost recently. The next name is Harry Belafonte. And I would love your thoughts about Harry Belafonte, his connection to the movement, and what he meant to you? Well, first of all, Harry Belafonte was built so so magnificently, physically structured. Harry Belafonte could have been an athlete himself. He could have been a high jumper. He could have ran the 200. He could have ran the quarter. Wow. Or he could have been a boxer. But he chose to be in the entertainment field. He chose to, you know, commemorate his, his legacy, his history, relative to him being Jamaican. So as a young individual growing up in Brooklyn, he decided that he would sing Calypso songs to bring Jamaica up to the forefront. But yet and still, with all of that, he didn't choose to be an individual that would point to himself and talk about what his accomplishments were. He was more concerned about the downtrodden individuals, those individuals that had so much to give to society that never had the opportunity. He fought for equality and justice and, and, and love and honor and respect for all individuals particularly for black people, because he was a black man and he knew the plight of black people. So you have to always give the respect to Harry Belafonte because he didn't just talk the game, he walked the game. He didn't just throw his message out there. When Harry was making money, he took his money and supported Dr. King in his civil rights activities as well. He marched with Martin Luther King. So it wasn't about him being a star as much as it was about us being stars as human beings. Wow, you just described Dr. John Carlos. Um, I the last name, and then I have one last question, and I'll let you go. You've been so generous with your time, but I have to ask you about the person I think you and I would agree was simply the best. Talking about Tina Turner, uh, your well, thoughts about the passing of the great Miss Tina Turner? Well, you know, I know Tina had a rough life coming up. Uh, you know, getting into show business, show business in itself is a rough life. But then when you hook up with a guy that is like a comedian, has changed through the beginning of her career with him until the time she was able to break away and become free. So like you could use that metaphor, thank God, thank God, thank God at last, I'm free at last. Uh, I remember one time my wife and I were down in, in uh, South Carolina. Uh, uh, and uh, we were staying at a hotel. In this particular hotel, Tina was staying at the hotel, too. I was always fascinated about Tina in terms of the message that she gave in her, in her music, uh, but I was even more fascinated about how active and how physical she was within her uh, oratory, you know, relative to her music, uh, the, the physical energy that she put into it. Mm. So I really wanted to meet her on a personal level, and I remember sitting in the lobby waiting for her, waiting for her to come come down or come back from where she was. And they snuck her in the back door. And I was so disappointed that I sat there all that time and never really got a chance to 
letting you have an opportunity to take a minute with her. And I remember going up to my room and my wife looked at me and she said, you look so dejected. You you must have missed Tina. Tina must not, not have come in. And it's funny because uh, my wife, in her young years, she almost became one of the I guess. So uh-huh. she knew Tina on a personal, personal level as well. But I always admired Tina Turner in terms of someone that say, I'm going to take, so to, so to speak, I'm going to take chicken shit and turn it into chicken salad. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what she did. A lesson for all of us. So j- just to right. wrap up, just to wrap up, I looking at the history you just laid out so clearly from Herb Douglas in 48 to yourself in 68 to Colin Kaepernick today, as you reflect on this history, what do you think athletic protest accomplishes? Well, I think protest, period, accomplishes much. But the difference with athletics and just a standard protest is the fact that we are universal. When I say we're universal, uh, you know, who other can you say is universal other than the president of the United States? Mm-hmm. They know him worldwide. While athletics, those individuals that we mentioned are icons of a sport. And they're recognized as well as that president on, on a level ground on a worldwide level. So when they step up to speak on issues, people take note. They stop and listen to what these individuals have to say, and it gives them an opportunity to weigh things in their mind as to whether it's right or whether it's wrong, whether it should move forward or whether it should move back. But many individuals don't realize that. You know, I always use the metaphor that, you know, there's man-made icons and there's God-given icons. The God-given icons are the ones that step forward and make the necessary uh, statements that needs to be made regardless of uh, reprisal or fear or anything. They're just going to do what they feel is the right thing to do to help this this world in which we live. Wow. Well, they accomplished so much. You are accomplishing and have accomplished so much. Dr. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us here on Edge of Sports. Well, Dave, you know, on the way out, man, let me just say, You know, when individuals such as those leave, it pushes you up closer to the front pew. Mm. I think right now, myself, as well as a few others, we're in that front pew now. We are the seniors. We're the ones that's going to lead the wagon train, so to speak. And I would just hope that everybody would realize their responsibility, not merely to themselves, but to society as a whole, to make this a better world. And right now, the situation that we're in in society, With all the division going on from the president or ex-president on down, uh, we have to do what we can do as athletes to bring some sort of clarity to what's going on in our lives. Because so many people are taking their lives right now and killing other individuals right now based on mental issues that they have, frustration that they have, confusion that they have. And all individuals have gone to music and have gone to sports to try and take the pressure off of them, to relieve them, to give them the opportunity to be free again. So as athletes, we have to be the, the spokesperson for society. Turn up the volume, I say. Mm. Well, I look forward to the decades that I certainly expect you to spend at the front of this wagon train. Uh, Dr. Carlos, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dave. Uh, you're much the best. love to you and the family. Yeah, much love to you and yours. You're the best. And now I've got some choice words about Saudi Arabia chowing down and digesting the willing meal that is the Professional Golfers Association Tour. Okay, look, there was a time in the way distant past, let's call it May, when the official position of the PGA Tour was that its competitor, the Saudi-backed golf tour known as Live, was a scandalous, even odious operation. Referring to Saudi Arabia's horrific human rights record, PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan said just last year, you'd have to be living under a rock to not understand the implications of involving yourself with the Saudis. But Monahan's strong comment is now just a reminder that pencils have erasers. In news that was initially shocking, but upon reflection really isn't shocking at all, the PGA Tour announced that it will permanently merge with the Live Tour. As Monahan said, the game of golf is better for what we've done today. Gee, does this mean that Monahan is now living under a rock? 
If anything, he has come out into the sunlight from beneath his rock to say that he does understand the implications of involving himself with the Saudis, and those implications are wealth beyond his wildest dreams. The Saudi crown prince, known as MBS, is promising to invest billions of petrodollars in this merger. In return, the PGA Tour is dropping all litigation against Liv for raiding its talent, and the PGA Tour will get a new name that is at least jointly approved by the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who has spearheaded a massive crackdown on dissent in the kingdom and pursued a war in Yemen that has resulted in one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. Now, way, way back when the PGA Tour was still protesting Liv's existence, its leaders claimed to be standing beside 9-11 Families United, which continues to demand, among other things, information about all the nations, especially Saudi Arabia, that helped the hijackers who flew the planes into the towers and Pentagon. 9-11 Families United's response to the news of the PGA Tour Live merger is scathing. And it reads in part, Our entire 9-11 community has been betrayed by Commissioner Moynihan and the PGA, as it appears their concern for our loved ones was merely window dressing in their quest for money. ESPN quoted an anonymous PGA Tour player who said of the day's news, It's insanity. The Live Tour was dead in the water. It wasn't working. Now you're throwing them a life jacket? Is the moral of the story to always take the money? Well, yeah. The moral reminds what Danny DeVito said in the movie Heist. Everybody needs money. That's why they call it money. This announcement, I would argue, is best understood as the latest win in the Saudi Kingdom's game of sports washing. That is, using sports as a shiny bauble to legitimize authoritarian regimes and distract from the regime's human rights abuses. And we gotta say it isn't surprising that Saudi Arabia would find a willing participant in the PGA Tour, a right-wing good old boy organization steeped in a good old boy brand of racism, sexism, and plantation nostalgia. Now it will happily re-embrace golfers it branded as traitors, literally, for leaving for live, such as Phil Mickelson, who took $200 million of Saudi money to leave the PGA Tour. At the time he took that nine-figure check, Mickelson said, and I quote, the Saudis are scary mother bleepers to get involved with. Referring to Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi citizen who wasn't just killed but beheaded and dismembered with a bone saw, Mickelson said, we know they killed Khashoggi and have a horrible record on human rights. They execute people over there for being gay. Knowing all of this, why would I even consider it? Because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reshape how the PGA Tour operates. Now, Mickelson later apologized for these comments, not to the Khashoggi family and not to LGBTQ people. He apologized to the Saud royal family. The PGA Tour's lack of human rights principles should surprise only the most naive among us. This is an organization that, of course, had a soft spot for Donald Trump. But then, of course, Trump also threw his lot in with the Live Tour as part of his greasy charm offensive towards the Saudi royal family. Part of the price for getting close to the family was ignoring the murder of Khashoggi. And in return, Liv sent several tournaments to Trump-owned clubs and a Saudi sovereign wealth fund led by the crown prince invested $2 billion in Trump's son-in-law Jared Kushner's new private equity firm just six months after Trump left office. Disgusting. What's particularly depressing about this episode is that last year, Trump presciently, it must be said, mocked the golfers who stayed with the PGA Tour and got on their high horses about Saudi human rights abuses. I want to read Trump's words, painful though it may be. He wrote on Truth Social, his idiotic social media page, all those golfers who remain loyal to the very disloyal PGA in all its different forms will pay a big price when the inevitable merger with Liv comes, and you get nothing but a big thank you 
from PGA officials who are making millions of dollars a year. If you don't take the money now, you will get nothing after the merger takes place. And only say how smart the original signees were. Now that unnamed PGA Tour player we quoted earlier, who asked whether the moral of this story is to always just take the money, in Trump's view, clearly, that answer is yes. Only suckers look past the money to focus on the blood on the floor. That thinking has now won the day among the PGA Tour brass. These are the politics of golf, writ clear and writ large. Authoritarian, angered at the thought of social responsibility, hostile to progress, and always looking for some big whale to suck up to with no regard to nationality or body count. Shame on any of us who thought this could have ended up in any way other than the Saudi Arabian royal family gobbling up professional men's golf while the ham-faced PGA Tour fat cats look away from Saudi atrocities and count the cash. Unreal. Except all too real. And now we have Dr. Maria Virai. So thrilled to have her on the show for our segment, Ask a Sports Scholar. Uh, she is the co-author, along with Dr. Rita Liberti, of Gridiron Gourmet, Gender and Food and the Football Tailgate. Dr. Virai, how are you? I'm good, Dave. Thanks for having me. What an incredibly enticing and mouthwatering title. Uh, can you explain this book to our viewers, please? Oh, wow. Sure. So we decided we wanted to learn more about the spectacle that is tailgating. And in that spectacle, we wanted to understand how gender plays out and especially masculinity. And so we have mostly men who are cooking, who are shopping for food. And um, that's, you know, counter to the typical stereotype and historical understandings of food and cooking labor. But it happens all under the cover of the football stadium. Mm. And so, so mm -hmm. it's OK. So we wanted to explore all of those dynamics. Did either you or Dr. Liberty have an aha moment where you mm. said, we need to write about tailgating or I need to write about this guy cooking something on the radiator of his car? Right. Uh, what, what, what was your uh, aha moment? You know, I think it started with um, Guy Fieri's um, show on the Food Network, Tailgate Warriors. And we read about it and we went to a taping of one of the episodes at the Oakland Coliseum when the Raiders were still playing in Oakland. And um, it was fascinating to watch this made for TV cooking competition come to life. And while we were there to observe that, we also took time to walk around the parking lot and see what the other tailgaters were doing. This is a preseason game, mind you. And we have one group who had a uh, fully roasted pig going on a rotisserie they had gotten there, if not the night before, like at the crack of dawn that day. Uh, and we thought this is some kind of commitment, right? Um, mm -hmm. to, to lay all that out and put all that labor into it. So we wanted to know more because within that aha moment was also a, oh, wow, this is so much more spectacle than we even thought. And we thought we knew. Following your argument here, uh, yeah. Dr. Virai, uh, what, what I'm hearing is that football provides almost a cover yeah. for men, for heterosexual men, right. to he practice the art of cooking in a way that maybe they feel like they can't in other spheres. Am I following that correctly? Yeah, I, I think so. That culinary cover makes it okay for them to be cooking, right? They're under the shadow of the football stadium, on the blacktop, outdoors, over fire grills. Um, you know, traditionally, historically, cooking and food labor have been considered, you know, women's work, um, non-professionalized cooking, right? Women's work. So women are, you know, caretaking, um, cooking for the family, for their husbands in this, again, heteronormative context on a daily basis. And if men are doing the cooking there, it's either special occasion, you know, dad makes breakfast pancakes mm -hmm. on the weekend. Um, or it's when dad is outdoors um, cooking, barbecuing, um, you know, that's kind of becomes his world outdoor over fire. Those some of those masculine signifiers of cooking, throw in red meat and then you've got, you know, the more complete picture. 
So that is happening at the football stadium, yet there's more to it. It's more nuanced than Mm -hmm. that uh, because men are also taking responsibility for the menu creation, for creating the shopping list, for doing the shopping. And they're planning a week ahead of time their menus and the logistics of their cooking setup on the blacktop. And they're also looking a whole season ahead sometimes to thinking about what they're going to be creating for the eight home games, you know, of the, the next season is there, are their menus going to have a theme? Are they going to try out a different dish uh, at that point? Well, what does tailgating tell us about America? Oh, wow. Huh. <sighs> and know, I ask that because I, I don't think it exists in other countries in the same way? No, it doesn't. And yeah, that's a good point. Because when I talk to people in other countries, they usually need an explanation Mm -hmm. for folks who have come to the U.S. from uh, different places. Yeah, it it is certainly uniquely American um, from from what we've found. How? It certainly tells us how deeply entrenched sport is in our culture, right? Mm -hmm. How pervasive of a cultural practice it is and how when it has that kind of popularity, it also becomes kind of the focal point around which other social festivities happen, right? Um, And it is a way to also, I think, extend the celebration of sport and the, you know, the opportunities to spectate and maybe even have an escape from daily life. Um, And it, it also indicates, I don't know, it tells us that there are you know, still gender flexes perhaps um, in the U S and that football has a lot to do with our understandings um, of gender and in particular masculinity. And so we see that thread that runs from, you know, the gridiron out to the blacktop. Yeah. It's a, it's a performance. Wow. That's a great point. And you know, it's not, maybe not so much in our circles, but uh, gender flexing is still Mm -hmm. so much a part of the United right. States, and we're probably in inning one of trying to change that uh, mm-hmm. more broadly to something what I would argue would be less toxic. Uh, yes. Look, I got to tell you, the thing I loved, loved, loved about your book, Gridiron mm-hmm. Gourmet, is that it wasn't just you and Dr. Liberty, you and Rita, uh, right. sitting and coming up with these ideas in a vacuum. You were out there talking to people who were tailgating. Yes. And yeah. it's so interesting, that kind of field work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also very macho terrain. Mm-hmm. You are two women coming from a college campus type environment. Yep, that's right. Uh, how difficult was it to make those connections and get people to talk? Or maybe it wasn't difficult at all. I have to say, it, it wasn't too difficult. We were, um, we were struck by the generosity of a number of the tailgaters we spoke to. And I think here a distinction is important that you can go to, you know, the blacktop of any professional and most big time college football games for tailgating. And you can easily find the groups that are just there for the drinking before they Mm. go into the game. Right. Um, So they just want to kind of get amped up and socialize and hang out. And they're boisterous and there's there's a lot of toxicity often in those groups. And they're not so much concerned about the food. It's like, okay, maybe some hot dogs bag of chips. So those weren't the folks we were interested in talking to, right? We wanted to find the folks who were, you know, seemingly being thoughtful about the food that they were um, eating and and cooking. So there was usually a different section of the blacktop, right? And for them, I would say maybe the biggest challenge was just Mm -hmm. breaking into their, you know, constrained time allotment. Um, as they were trying to prepare things before they had to, you know, not only eat them themselves, but and sometimes feed 20 to 30 people mm. and then pack up to go into the watch the game because the fans we talked to were very much into being able to watch the game. What, what, what was the most interesting thing you saw cooked? Mm. And did any of these folks feed you? And that's my last question. Oh, they did. So most interesting. Well, I'll tell you, I can tell you about some of the groups that we encountered um, in San Francisco, Santa Clara, technically, with the 49ers. Um, There's one tailgate group called the Third Rail Niners. These guys come in and they set up what looks like a professional catering um, situation um, in their section of the blacktop. So they've got a smoker, they've got a grill, they've got, you know, a hot table, and they're doing smoked chicken, they're doing bacon-infused mac and cheese, 
sesame chicken, grilled tri-tip. And I mean, I, there aren't too many restaurant meals I've had that were better <laughs> than mm-hmm. what they very generously um, offered us. And, and that was pretty common. We'd walk around, uh, you know, that group in particular um, really stood out for us. Rita was able to visit LSU um, before a Saturday football game. And she uh, met the Black Pot Mafia tailgating group. So we have this very, mm. you know, communal groups that the men who are part of them strongly identify with. And then that group is in turn strongly identified with the team they're following. And they had, you know, varieties of gumbo going, a 40-gallon gumbo pot. And she saw groups there also doing the full-on um, alligator. So wow. we yep. see a lot of regional representation as mm. well in tailgating. Wow. How many books are this incisive? about gender, about race, which you deal with in the book, yeah. about uh, the question of heteronormativity, mm-hmm. yet at the same time, really makes me hungry. Yeah, right. It's a, it's a <laughs> very potent combination. Thank uh, you. <laughs> v- very last question. I think everybody should read Gridiron Gourmet, but what's a book you've read recently that you want to recommend? Oh, gosh. Let me think. Hmm. I've been reading more um, fiction lately. And this is pretty far afield from what we're talking about. There's a tiny, there's a tiny thread though. Barbara Kingsolver's latest novel, Demon Copperhead. And so she's exploring what's been happening in Appalachia and, um, how big pharma has really exploited, um, that group of people and, um, with getting so many addicted on Mm -hmm. opioids and the main character at one point in his life is a high school football star. Um, mm. until his um, knee is blown out in a game. Wow. And then you can imagine what ensues given the, um, the topic, the subject mm. of the book. Um, so that was really powerful. Wow. Um, I enjoyed that, yeah. Yeah, someday the Sackler family will be beneath hell looking up and waving. Right. Uh, Dr. Veer, I thank you so much for joining us on our segment, Ask a Sports Scholar. Uh, Dave, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Thank you, Dr. John Carlos. Thank you, Dr. Maria Verai. For The Real News Network, I'm Dave Zirin. You stay frosty out there. We are out of here. Peace. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.